Well, I have a confession to make. 57 years ago, my bar mitzvah took place at the Sharai Shemayim Synagogue in Toronto. To prepare for the occasion, I was required to go to Hebrew school every afternoon after public school for three years. As a result, I know the Hebrew alphabet, not much more. Um, the Hebrew school collected donations for the Israeli charity, Karen Hakayemet. And it taught us that Israel made the desert bloom. It was a land without people for a people without land. In time, I learned that the Zionist state backed the US war in Vietnam, sold weapons to US backed dictatorships across Latin America, and that so called socialist kibbutzim comprised only 3% of the population and played a mostly mercenary role on the borderlands. I learned that Israel was founded on lies. Not only that Palestinian land was largely unoccupied, that lie, but the lie that 750,000 Palestinians fled their homes and villages during their ethnic cleansing by Zionist militias in 1948 because they were told to do so by Arab leaders. The lie that it was Arab armies that started the 1948 war that saw Israel seize 78% of historic Palestine. The lie that Israel faced annihilation in 1967, forcing it to invade and occupy the remaining 22% of Palestine, as well as land belonging to Egypt and Syria. Israel still lives on lies. The lie that Israel wants a just and equitable peace and will support a sovereign Palestinian state. The lie that Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. For Palestinians, it is markedly less democratic than apartheid South Africa, according to Bishop Desmond Tutu. The lie that Israel is an outpost of Western civilization in a sea of Arab barbarism. The lie that Israel respects the rule of law and human rights, according to Amnesty International Human Rights Watch at B'Tselem, an Israeli human rights organization, it does not. The lie that security is the motor force of Israeli foreign policy. Israel votes annual, annually with a tiny minority of countries at the United Nations to uphold the US embargo of Cuba. The lie that Zionism is the moral agency of the victims of the Jewish Holocaust. It is well known that the Zionist movement collaborated with the Nazis in Europe. Over the past 75 years, it has turned Palestinians into the Jews of the Middle East. Is this not happening now to the residents of Gaza? Consider the original Zionist objectives. It was not merely to colonize Palestine, but to expel and replace the indigenous population. Zionism from the 19th century through the 1940s was a tiny minority movement among diaspora Jews. Socialism was the dominant trend including revolutionary Marxism. Jews like Leon Trotsky, Grigory Zinoviev, Karl Radek, Yaakov Sverdlov, Maxim Litvinov, Lev Kabinev, and Moise Iritsky were leaders of the Russian Revolution. To say nothing of Rosa Luxemburg in Poland and Karl Marx himself in Germany. So Zionism needed and sought imperial sponsors for the bloody enterprise of colonization and dispersal of the Palestinians. The European <laughs> colonial powers wanted to exploit cheap labor and natural resources everywhere, including in the Middle East. Poel Hatsair, the young worker, and a supporter of Poal Zion, Workers of Zion, coined the slogan, Conquest of Labor, Kibush Avoda in Hebrew, which meant displace Palestinian workers. They called upon Jewish capitalists, Rothschild plantation managers who got land from the absentee, absentee Turkish landlords, 
over the heads of the Palestinian people, and I quote, to hire Jews and only Jews, close quote. They organized boycotts against non-compliant Jewish businesses. At the beginning of the 19th century, there were 1,000 Palestinian villages. Trades, crafts, textiles, and agriculture flourished. Palestinians welcomed Jews, as well as Armenians fleeing genocide in Turkey in 1915. Arch right-wing Zionist Vladimir Yapotinsky supported the genocidal Turkish regime. There was no organized Jew hatred in Palestine, unlike in Russia and Poland. In 1896, Theodore Herzl, a founder of Zionism, proposed that the Ottoman Empire grant Palestine to the Zionist movement as, quote, an outpost of civilization as opposed to barbarism, close quote. That's where that expression emanates. In 1905, the Seventh World Zionist Congress recognized the threat posed by emerging Palestinian nationalism and offered to defend the Sultan's rule. When Germany made an alliance with Turkey, the Zionists appealed to Germany. By 1914, the World Zionist Organization moved to enlist the British Empire, which aimed to break up the Ottoman Empire and seize control of the Middle East. Chaim Weizmann said Jewish settlement would civilize the country and guard the Suez Canal for Britain. Along came the Balfour Declaration on November 2nd, 1917 favoring, quote, a national home for the Jewish people. Zionists claimed that Palestine was a wasteland, but also insisted that Palestinians be prevented from cultivating the soil. Britain used colonization as an instrument for political control of Palestine. Weizmann's ally, General Jan Smuts of South Africa, boosted the Balfour Declaration. Herzl was a big admirer of Sir Cecil Rhodes, an arch imperialist. South African capitalists established Africa Israel investments to buy land in Palestine. That company still exists. Its assets are held by Israel's bank, Luomi. Vladimir Jabotinsky, who I mentioned a moment ago, the founder of revisionist Zionism, was explicit about the Zionist aim to expel and or decimate the Palestinians whom he compared to the Aztecs and the Sioux indigenous people. In his book, The Iron Wall, he expounds the doctrine of pure blood. Even the liberal philosopher Martin Buber affirms that, quote, our being is determined by blood, close quote. Compatible with European racist doctrines of the time, it is no stretch to say that Zionism is rooted in racism. By 1931, 20,000 peasant families were evicted by Zionists. The, Jew the British Mandate government awarded 90% of concessions to Jewish capital. Concessions in terms of roads, Dead Sea minerals, electricity, ports, etc. By 1935, Zionists controlled 872 of 1,212 industrial firms in Palestine. The loss of land, jobs, and the increasing repression fueled a Palestinian uprising between 1936 and 1939. The British imposed martial law. There were many arrests, attacks, houses were blown up. 6,000 people were left homeless in Jaffa. That's just to the south of Tel Aviv. The British created a Zionist quasi-police force, the, col the colony police, so-called, numbering 14,000 in 1939. A Royal Commission of Inquiry issued the Peel Report. What did it say? It assessed the causes of the revolt stemming from a rise of Arab nationalism, increasing Jewish immigration and land purchases. The failure of religious leaders, including the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, the feudal landowners, and the new Palestinian bourgeoisie to support the revolt enabled the British and Zionists to crush the rebellion. The Palestinian struggle, in one form or another, 
has been continuous since 1918, with civil disobedience, general strikes, boycotts, non-payment of taxes, and demonstrations. Like other national liberation struggles in the 20th and 21st centuries, the Palestinian struggle demonstrates that the national bourgeoisie has no independent or progressive role to play in national emancipation. It is tied to imperialism, as Trotsky said, by a thousand threads. It is tied to imperialism and to neo-colonial regimes such as the current Palestinian Authority based in Ramallah and Hamas based in Gaza. Only the working class with the support of poor farmers is able to fight all the way to freedom. Only through socialist revolution can this fight mobilize the majority and win, just as the Bolsheviks did in Russian and in, in the Russian Revolution and the Fidel Castroists did in the Cuban Revolution. This is the strategy of permanent revolution. Permanent revolution is counterposed to reliance on bourgeois nationalists. It is counter to the disastrous two-state solution. When the United Nations partitioned Palestine in 1947, Jews were 31% of the population. The big imperialists and Joseph Stalin's USSR gave 54% of the fertile land to the Zionists. Before the State of Israel was established, the Urgun and Haganah formed in 1920 to defend the Yishuv, these were the early Jewish settlements, the colonial settlements. These two gangs, the Irgun and the Haganah, seized three quarters of the land and expelled almost all of its inhabitants. 385 of 475 Palestinian towns were razed to, to the ground. By May, 4, by May 15, 1948, 750,000 Palestinians were driven out. How? By terrorist actions. Recall the massacre at Deir Yassin, an operation headed by Menachem Begin, a future prime minister of Israel. And then the massacre that occurred at Duima. Then it happened at refugee camps in Gaza in the 1950s, at Kibyat, uh, in October 1953. An onslaught led by none other than Ariel Sharon, another future prime minister. And then at Kfar Qasim in October 1956. What do we mean by an apartheid state? Is it an exaggeration? In the first place, only Jewish labor is allowed. There is no leasing of land to non-Jews. The right of return, in Hebrew is called aliyah, is for Jews only. So a Jew in Brooklyn has more rights than a displaced Palestinian in Tunisia or Damascus or Tripoli. Jewish religious laws apply to marriage. You can't legally marry a non-Jew in Israel. 93% of the land belongs to the Jewish National Fund. And the most racist, exclusivist organization is the kibbutz, which mocks the notion of cooperation, much less the idea of socialist internationalism. Zionism and fascism always had much in common. The revisionist Zionist youth, known as Beitar, wore black shirts or brown shirts. Begin's preference was for the brown. And employed the fascist salute. Basically, Fascists wanted Jews out of Europe, and so did the Zionists. The Zionist Federation of Germany sent a message of support to the Nazi party in June 1933. The World Zionist Organization defeated a resolution, 240 to 43 votes, calling for action against Hitler in 1933. <laughs> The World Zionist Organization's Anglo-Palestine Bank broke the international boycott of the Zionist, sorry, broke the international boycott of the Nazi regime. 
They facilitated the purchase, purchase of Nazi goods and importing them into Palestine. Joseph Goebbels praised Zionism in a major report in 1934. Adolf Eichmann, remember that name? He was invited to Palestine as a guest of the Haganah. Zionists were willing to sacrifice anything and anyone for the colonization of Palestine. As late as 1943, while the Jews of Europe were being exterminated in their millions, Rabbi Stephen Weiss, leader of the American Jewish Congress, opposed any change in US immigration laws to enable Jews to find refuge. And you know, the same was true in Canada. Canadian government said one is too many. Dr. Rudolf Kastner of the Jewish Agency Rescue Committee in Budapest signed a secret pact with Adolf Eichmann to quote, settle the Jewish question in Hungary. It sent 600 prominent Jews to Palestine and kept silent. About 800,000 Hungarian Jews to be exterminated. On January 11, 1941, Yitzhak Shamir, the seventh prime minister of Israel, proposed a formal <laughs> military pact between the Irgun and the Nazi Third Reich. Zionism's betrayal of the victims of the Holocaust was the culmination of its attempt to identify the interests of Jews with the interests of the established order. Today, the Zionists joined their state apparatus to the might of US imperialism, including the covert operations of the CIA on all continents. Instead of seeking social justice and fighting the ruling classes which cultivate anti-Semitism, and the persecution of Jews, including reactionary Arab and Muslim regimes, the Zionists curry favor from them. As the great Ukrainian Jewish Marxist Leon Trotsky explained, the emancipation of the Jews is bound up with the fate of the world socialist revolution. Trotsky, along with the renowned Polish Marxist Isaac Deutscher, predicted that the Zionist state would be a death trap, a death trap for the Jews. As we can see today, Israel and its egregious crimes are a lightning rod for anti-Semitism. The antidote to anti-Semitism is anti-Zionism. The particularly potent antidote are the anti-Zionist Jews like independent Jewish voices, among whom I count myself. The story of Israel is a story of successive waves of expansion. 1956, 1967, 1974, plus the invasion of Lebanon in 1982, and the fascist massacre at Sabra and Shatila refugee camps, supervised by Ariel Sharon. Along the way, the Arab regimes were complicit with Zionism, most egregiously, most egregiously when Jordan's monarchy carried out a slaughter of insurgent Palestinian forces in September 1970, known thereafter as Black September. On top of this is the repression of the first intifada, which, was, which took place December 1987 to 1991 the prevalence of torture in Israeli prisons, the case of nuclear weapons whistleblower, Mordecai Vanunu. He told the world that Israel has the bomb. For that, he was imprisoned and eventually released. Summary arrests and murders by Shin Beit, the so-called security service, the daily illegal brutalities that include the bulldozing of Palestinian homes, destruction of olive groves, Shootings, maiming, strafing, and bombing leading to the genocide in Gaza today. What about the so-called two-state solution? 
the Oslo Accords, starting in 1993, based on the Camp David Accords of 1978, did not constitute a break with Zionist policy. No, no. Much less a break with the character of the state, acting in close alliance with Washington. Oslo was a policy of containment, an attempt to co-opt the Palestinian revolution. Yasser Arafat's PLO, his regime, was thoroughly corrupt, anti-democratic, and repressive. It proved to be completely powerless and subordinate to Israel and the United States. Al Fatah, the conservative nationalist movement, and the Palestine Authority, currently led by Mahmoud Abbas, is isolated and despised by poor and working class Palestinians. It is paid by Israel to police and repress West Bank Palestinian residents. Today, as the white settlers maraud through the Palestinian villages of the West Bank, what is the Palestine Authority doing to stop it? Even if Arafat and his successors could have gained control over Jerusalem, the Palestine question would remain unresolved. Hamas and Hezbollah gained popularity by filling a political vacuum created by Fatah's capitulation to Washington and Tel Aviv. The Zionist state favored Hamas over the PA. You think it's ironic? Think about it. They favored Hamas over the PA because the message of the Islamic fundamentalists is repugnant to most working class Israelis. They wanted to cement a block against the, the national push. In the face of the new atrocities committed by Zionism, the Palestinian resistance continues, rising again and again and again. What are the tasks of Democrats and socialists in relation to the Palestinian resistance today? The primary task is to educate and mobilize public opinion to oppose Israel's military aggression against the Palestinians. And we saw that in Ottawa yesterday, when over 20, maybe 30,000 people rallied in front of parliament, demanding ceasefire now, permanent ceasefire, stop the war, stop the genocide. It is necessary to confront and expose the myths about the Zionist state. That's another task. Do not submit to intimidation by pro-Zionist organizations and media. Defend those who the capitalist state and the rulers seek to silence. Challenge Canadian government and business complicity with US domination <laughs> of the Middle East and specifically with the crimes of the apartheid state. UN resolutions which condemn Israeli aggression but impose no sanctions on the aggressor are clearly inadequate. But to vote against such motions is worse than inadequate. It is an act of imperialist contempt for the oppressed and an act of abject submission to Washington and Wall Street. Which is worse, the liberals' hypocrisy, Washing Ottawa's abstention cast by Bob Ray in the United Nations vote for a ceasefire now, or the NDP expelling MPP Sarah Jama from its caucus in the Ontario legislature. Okay. The fact that the federal NDP now calls for a ceasefire, albeit while blaming both sides in the conflict equally, is a product of pro-Palestinian pressure on the streets and inside the NDP in which the Socialist Caucus proudly played a significant role. Equally important is the task of forging principled unity and mass actions on the basis of a concrete program of democratic demands. One, stop the violent attacks on Palestinians. Two minutes. Remove Zionist forces from the occupied territories now. Arrest and try Israeli soldiers, police, and civilians accused of murder and assault. Two, dismantle the Zionist settlements. Lift the restrictions on Palestinian freedom to travel and to work in Israel and the occupied territories. Tear down the apartheid wall. Three, 
recognize and facilitate the right of return of all Palestinians to their homeland, strike down all laws that, that discriminate against Arabs and Muslims in Israel, advance the campaign for boycott, divestment, and sanctions against the Zionist state. On this basis, a broad political movement for social justice in Palestine can be built, even larger than the present historic global movement. Currently, many unions, including QP Ontario, OPSU, Unifor, and CUPW, are joining with student, feminists, seniors, environmentalists, and international solidarity organizations to demand a permanent ceasefire now. This is an important step forward because it challenges the Zionist rationale for the war, and it relies on the mobilization of working people and our allies, not on the government or the business elite. Needed is a mass movement that welcomes believers and non-believers alike, which is democratic and open. Socialists have a further responsibility to present a cogent, coherent analysis of the current conflict in the global context, evident in the decline in American hegemony, and to advance a program in the interest of the worldwide working class. The starting point in strategic terms for a program for peace with social justice is the termination of the apartheid Zionist state. Remove the oppressor state, not the Jews. And it requires the revolutionary transformation of all the bourgeois Arab states. For the Palestinians, a so-called two-state solution is nothing more than pleading for a Bantustan arrangement such as existed in apartheid South Africa. In fact, the weaker the Bantustan is in relation to its master state, the more repressive and undemocratic it must be to its residents. At the same time, socialists uphold the right of oppressed nations to obtain whatever degree of autonomy or sovereignty possible. Socialists support Palestinian self-determination. But here is a parallel question. Does Israel have the right to defend itself as Justin Trudeau insists? Does any state have the right to defend itself if it oppresses a captive people or nation? No. The right to self-determination is a right for oppressed nations, not for oppressor states. Liberalism obscures the distinction between oppressed and oppressors. It aims to balance rights on the head of a pin in a vacuum. It divides the working class with abstract slogans. Socialists insist on concrete principles. We support indigenous self-determination, not the rights of the Canadian petroleum state. We support Palestinian self-determination, not the exclusivist, racist, Zionist so-called Jewish state built on stolen land. The transitional slogan that best advances the goal of emancipation is this, for a democratic, secular Palestine. The global anti-war movement will find ways to stem the flow of investment and weaponry to Israel. And as that occurs, Jewish Israeli workers will come to their senses. They will unite with the indigenous Palestinians against the war machine that profits from misery. They will merge with world public opinion to end bloodshed, oppression, and imperialist domination forever. Unlike the reactionary utopia of Zionism and the all too real risk of nuclear war arising from it, this is a perspective truly worth fighting to win for a democratic secular Palestine as part of a regional and global permanent revolution. Thanks very much. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Barry. I'm so glad to see that our guest speaker could make it in the chaos of this Santa Claus parade up there. So, and all the construction. So our next speaker is Gada Sasso. She is a PhD candidate in international relations at McMaster University, writing her thesis on Israeli green colonialism. She is a Palestinian third generation refugee and organizer based in the Takaranto region. Gada is on the steering committee of the Palestinian Canadian Academics and Artists Network, PCAAN, and co-chaired the rally for Palestine on October the 15th at Hamilton City Hall on the last day of the NDP Federal Convention. So a warm welcome here in the room and online to Gada. Hello everyone, thank you so much for having me and I do apologize for the delay. <laughs> um, I wanted to, I guess, speak just a little bit about the Nefa. You did a great job about speaking about it, so I'm not going to go into too much depth, but I think um, I just wanted to add a bit about 
a bit on that from my personal perspective. So my father is here. Um, my father comes from the city of Ramla, which is part of what's now called Israel, and we refer to as 1948 Palestine. And uh, my mother is from a village near, now this called Madama, which is part of the Israeli occupied West Bank. So Palestinians have lived for millennia in the land of Palestine. It was diverse, you know, a group of people. Um, and it's just uh, basically, it wasn't until the founding of Zionism in the late 19th century in Europe as a settler colonial ideology that it sought to create a Jewish ethnocentric state. And at the time, Zionism um, understood that about only 5% of the Palestinian population was actually Jewish. And so in order to establish a Jewish state, it had to ethnically cleanse the vast majority of the indigenous Palestinian population. And that was okay with them because at the time it was viewed that any country outside of Europe was essentially open for colonization. It was considered empty land or terra nullius. So sure enough with the British help, right? Of course, um, they were able to establish Zionist militias and then they were able to ethnically cleanse about 80% of Palestinians by 1948, including my father's family, my grandfather. Um, some of our family's members were killed by Israel. My grandfather was injured. He had shrapnel in his neck until he died. And um, they were expelled to neighboring Syria. And that's when Israel took about 78% of historic Palestine. Later in 1967, Israel occupied the remaining 22% of Palestine. And that means that Israel controls our lands and resources, but it decided not to annex it in order not to include us in its demographic majority or uh, to provide us any rights. So until now, of course, yes, we're seeing it just being partitioned more into Bantu spans. So people who talk about a two-state solution, it is completely dead. And uh, because the solution is dead, all we have to work towards is a one-state solution. And also the one-state solution is the just one, because a lot of people forget, but Palestinians like myself have the right to return to our homes and lands. So even though I don't have a you know, even though I have a Canadian citizenship, until now I can't even visit my father's home city of Ramle because I have a Palestinian ID passed down from my mom. And so um, as recognized by UN Resolution 194, this is at the forefront, even when we look at Gaza, because about 80% of the Palestinian population in Gaza is actually like, they're all refugees from 48. And so this is what is important to recognize that Zionism since its founding, <laughs> was based, it is a genocidal project because it is based on sector colonialism. And it's an apartheid project. Even within 1948 Palestine, about 60 laws discriminate against non-Jews. So what I want to talk about, about was um, the prisoner situation as we're seeing now, Palestinian prisoners being released. And it's just disgusting. Even now on, in the car, they're talking about it on the radio, how you know the Israeli hostages are humanized. On the other hand, Palestinian prisoners are dehumanized and you know, they're vilified. And I wanna say about 5,000 Palestinians have been imprisoned until now by Israel, including many women and children, and many people are administered detainees, which means they were arrested without charge or trial. Uh, one of the prisoners, his name is Ahmed Manasseh, I've been lobbying for his release since January. We did two parliamentary petitions that were presented by Alexandre Bilaris. We had a press conference in parliament, um, all for the Canadian government, you know, uh, minister, <laughs> Jolie to essentially tell us that um, she didn't even mention Ahmed's name, you know, in the response, Rob Alifan on her behalf just said, uh, you know, we support peace <laughs> and we're super giving donations and just this like empty statement and we care for Israeli and Palestinian kids, actually putting Israeli kids first as if they're the primary victims. So I just want to say it's so essential for all our prisoners to be free. Ahmed was actually arrested by Israel when he was only 13 years old. A settler ran him over. He was accused of stabbing Israeli settlers. His cousin, who was 15 at the time, Hassan, was killed. And um, even after Israeli courts have cleared Ahmed of any wrongdoing, they have arrested and tortured him. And um, right now, Ahmed has been suicidal for a while. And for the last two years, they've held him under solitary confinement. So that speaks to the brutality of the Israeli regime, but also their impunity. I mean, over the last year, they raided his home twice, stole his mom's car, gold. They urinated in their drawers. I mean, I don't know if that speaks to like, just like how arrogant and impugned they are and how they, they really want to just devastate Palestinians, you know, when they go and assassinate a prominent journalist and they attack her coffin in front of TV, that speaks to how they feel so sheltered, not only by Western politicians, 
but also the media. You know, I was there at the protest yesterday in Ottawa, and it's like I hardly saw any prominent like media outlets, you know, it's disgusting. So yeah, I 100% recognize the media is complicit and I've stopped accepting interviews from there actually. Um, another part that I wanted to focus on was what we can do as Palestinian and allies to free the land. And so one thing I wanted to focus on is of course the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement, which was launched back in 2005 by Palestinian civil society, which calls on us to boycott Israeli products. But there's a specific list you can find on, on the BDS movement website. Um, you know, products like HP, Aroma, Sabra, these are the ones that we need to target because they're the most complicit. And by being strategic, we can really have an impact. Um, we're also called in divesting, so stopping to invest in Israeli companies. And that's the work that we can do, you know, right, unions, we can, um, you know, look at our investments, we can, as students, you know, pressure our universities to stop investing in these companies. So this is where that level's at. And then the last level, of course, is sanctions, which is calling on countries to sanction Israel. And we're seeing that happen worldwide now in several countries. But um, it's really important to support this movement because it's built after the apartheid South Africa movement, which was, you know, they took about 31 years to really pressure the apartheid South African regime to fall. It was effective. And so if we look at that, I remember Jamal Jama, he's a Palestinian uh, leading organizer for BDS. And several years ago, he visited us at York University. And he was saying at the time how, you know, he expects, you know, maybe the same timeline, like Palestine should be free. So 2005, 31 years, that's, you know, 2036. But actually, if you look at visualizing Palestine, they have a beautiful graphic that shows how actually the Palestinian boycott movement in many ways has been progressing faster than the South African one. So I personally, one of the people who believe that by 2030, Palestine will be free. But also, I view that we are at such a critical time right now. And what I really appreciate about this event is talking about capitalism. Because um, as Ronald Barhuti, co-founder of the BDS movement has said, the BDS South African apartheid movement was successful at dismantling political apartheid, but not economic apartheid, because they were in dismantling capitalism. So wealth remained in many of the white people there. And so, what we learned from that as BDS movement is we have to tackle the capitalist oppressive systems system and attached to that, we need to tackle white supremacy at its core, as well as patriarchy. You know, I'm seeing now, um, <laughs> um, I've been I've been very open about that. You know, I challenge, you know, queer phobia, I challenge misogyny everywhere, including in my own community. I think it's so important right now, especially in a diverse area, a so-called Canada that we, do you know some critical personal self-reflection and reach out to different ethnic communities, religious communities to bring solidarity around how do we actually tackle all these three systems? And you know, it wasn't lost on people that this so-called truce <laughs> was announced on you know Black Friday and it's gonna end on you know Cyber Monday. It's like, you know, it's almost like allowing people to, you know, opportunity to buy and because I know personally, like I haven't been buying much. I don't know what you guys over the last month, but um, you know, it's like, we need to see how, I don't know, for me, it's just like a lesson how so much, so little of this like consumption actually matters. Like what really matters are, you know, freedom, health. And so it's so important for us, um, I think at this moment to come together, we can look at climate change and, you know, the dire, you know, that's, it's quickly taking a toll on our societies and we need to take action. So all of these issues are tied together. Uh, my project actually looks at Israeli green colonialism, which means that I look at how Israel establishes national parks and nature reserves to colonize Palestinian land. For example, I look at Israeli US um, independence park, which Israel established back in the 1970s with the help of the US through um, American donations. And they established it over about eight Palestinian villages. And what Israel does is actually plants a lot of these villages. So, sorry, plants a lot of these parks. <laughs> and actually what it does is it deforests the, you know, olive trees and the other indigenous flora. And then it plants invasive pines to Europeanize the area, but also literally to cover the ruins of the villages. So people who are walking, you know, Israeli tourists, et cetera, they, do not realize that they're literally walking above the rubble of homes that Israel destroyed. And then of course, what Israel does is like in their pamphlets and uh, websites, they just completely erase 
you know, Palestinians, or they're just kind of, you know, and we see actually the same thing happening in so-called Canada. Until now, Canada builds national parks without Indigenous consent. They use that as an excuse to evict the Indigenous populations. And, um, you know, and then they brand them as so-called wilderness, untouched, right? Like, as if, you know, there's people are living there and shaping the region for centuries, right? So, um, in my project, I look at how what Israel's doing actually is like, it takes a lot of inspiration from the U.S. and Canada settler colonies. And actually, Western environmentalism itself, founded in the 18th century was all about separating humans from nature. This idea that like to protect nature, we need to separate it from humans, specifically like seeing poor people, people of color and women as the culprits. And so this is why we have to look at, you know, environmentalism, I say we have to decolonize it. And I draw inspiration from a lot of indigenous communities, including in Palestine, where it's a much more reciprocal relationship with nature. You know, it's like, um, and, and we're seeing now um, even more environmentalists like understand this concept and promote it. For example, we're seeing um, tribal parks being established in so-called Canada, which actually recognize indigenous rights, right? And it's like, um, how do we, you know, because these national parks haven't actually done any good <laughs> for the environment. What we need is to look, look at the root system of climate change and then we go from there. <laughs> so um, I really liked what you said about the, <laughs> the Anglo-Palestine bank. You know, a couple of days ago, we were doing a panel and uh, had a lot of Zionists asking like, oh, where did Palestine exist? You know, but if you look at Zionist literature, you can just see how, yeah, even they would call it the Anglo-Palestine bank. That's what became actually the National Bank of Israel. The first Zionist bank was the Jewish Colonial Trust. So like early Zionists was very, were very open about their colonial intentions, right? It's only that now it became a bad word. They're like resisting that framing. But yeah, I think um, it's obviously like really inspiring to see what's happening in Gaza right now that, you know, these people are rising up to a nuclear state and we have to recognize that Gaza has been besieged for the last 17 years. They've been under illegal occupation since 1967. And as I said, this is a genocide project. It's a slow genocide. You know, it's only 1967. Israel actually killed about 80,000 Palestinians. Way more than that now with, of course, the, you know, almost 20,000 that they've just killed in the last month. But um, the idea is that what we're seeing in Gaza right now is a more obvious example of genocide. But every single day, we have Palestinians murdered. When I visit Nablus, I know that there are a lot of people who get killed that it's not even reported here, right? But every day they're, they're checking like who's been murdered. Every day we have invasions um, and Palestinians, you know, we we have lost a lot of martyrs and it's been devastating and traumatic, but also it's like our liberty and dignity is valuable. And it's really inspiring to see how Palestinians are um, standing up for themselves and, you know, and also just beautiful to see all the solidarity, you know, um, see people boycotting and and risking so much. I mean, that's what kind of makes Palestine unique is, you know, not only are we made stateless and erased and our culture is being stolen, but like, on the other hand, it's like, you're not even allowed to talk about the trauma, right? And I think this is um, where we can resist in so many different ways. We all have our own interests and skills. Um, and so, you know, maybe that looks just like signing a petition for Palestine or taking part in rallies. Um, personally, as an academic, I really try to focus on speaking my truth. And, you know, um, the university can be a quite oppressive state, oppressive space. <laughs> and so, for example, like, you know, I know I've submitted to journals before and I have blind peer reviewers being like, don't talk about Zionism or don't talk about you know, it's really violence. Talk more about like, you know, <laughs> Palestinian environmentalism, almost like, you know, they romanticize this whole like indigenous noble savage trope, right? And so I have to constantly push against that and I have to take risks. And I found in my experience, unfortunately, sometimes it's not only until I take risks and I go against the system that I see impact happen, right? So like, um, even recently, I, I published a very critical review of uh, a book on environmentalism that was quite racist. And um, my master's research, research actually 
I um, looked at greenwashing and I used that research to urge my faculty of environmental studies at York University <laughs> to end and not renew the relationship with Arava. So that was actually the first form of academic boycott, as far as I understand, in North America. And you can imagine, like, even there, like, we faced backlash. But it's like, um, you know, a month later, the university, the president of the university cracked down on us. She's like, faculties don't have the right to boycott. It has to go through me, right? There's, she's like, cracking down on, like, faculty <laughs> democracy. And uh, a month later, they tried to revoke it. And I was there to defend the motion. And, you know, it's just like, we can't, we have to push back now stronger than ever. And I draw actually a lot of inspiration from Black and Indigenous communities. Um, for example, last year we were supposed to, I went to Nashville because um, there's there was International Studies Association Conference, which is the biggest conference in my field. And at the time uh, we were supposed to have the first BDS panel of the conference's history, but the organizers of the International Studies Association rejected it explicitly because they told us it wasn't balanced. We didn't have Zionist voices and um, essentially, you know, we pushed back in various ways, but a year later, I really <laughs> sent them an email to the president of the organization of the conference. And I said, this is unacceptable. This is a form of anti-Palestinian racism. If there was a panel on Black Lives Matter. You would not have, you know, you would not, yeah, exactly. <laughs> You're not asking the KKK's voice to be there. So um, I asked for consistency and sure enough, he's like, okay, like just apply again. I said, no, you're going to have to guarantee in writing. He's like, we're going to guarantee it'll be accepted. Sure enough, they accepted it. And so this year we held the first like BDS conference panel in this conference. So the idea is like, we need to keep pushing back. We need to keep taking risks and it can be scary. And of course, like I navigating my family is like, care, like, you know, they worry about me, but at the same time, it's like, we are so privileged here. You know, I, I look at people back home, we're not any better than people in Gaza, literally risking their lives. What do I risk? A degree, right? I just had a just had a prof a, year, a month ago. He publicly threatened me to like, he's gonna work day and night to make sure I don't get my PhD. <laughs> and it's like, you can threaten all you want. Um, you know, it's like, at the end of the day, um, I really do believe that, you know, there's a expression in Arabic that Sahib uh, al Sultan, the the beholder of justice is a sultan or king, you know, like there's nothing for you to fear. Or even, che, uh, sorry, Fidel Castro, this uh, slogan, condemn me, history will absolve me, was it? Authenticate. Can't remember exactly. Now. <laughs> yes, something like this, right? Um, but the idea is like, yeah, like when we look back at, you know, this 10 years, 20 years from now, like we are the ones who are going to be proud and the racists will be pretending that they were on the right side of history. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> thank you. History will absolve me, yes. Uh, so yeah, I think all of these uh, things tied together is yes, we are fighting for one state solution, freedom. We need the wall to be dismantled. We need Israeli occupation to end right now. A ceasefire is not enough. And I always say that there's no even ceasefire under settler colonialism because every day, right, they're killing our people. I have to worry about my own family in the West Bank because, you know, every day they're killing children there and just invading and ruining the olive harvest so we have to keep fighting for a better world and i actually did want to touch on the independent Jewish voices sure. Sure. <laughs> i have amazing comrades there that i really respect and i know that they're anti-zionist but i want to recognize that unfortunately the organization itself has still refused to become anti-zionist and that's shameful i was at their conference this um last spring and and yeah, I, I spoke about it and I just felt like I was dismissed as a Palestinian. And so a central message actually I wanted to say here was we need to center Palestinian voices. When we're telling you that Zionism is at the core of our trauma, we need that to be taken seriously. Like this is the time for Zionism to be abolished as a white supremacist and Islamophobic concept, right? Because like Palestine is not a religious issue, but the way that the, we're being described as terrorists, as hateful by Olivia Chow, by all our politicians, that's actually like drawing on Islamophobic tropes. So we need to yeah, challenge this ideology. And yeah, I think, um, you know, Jewish Voice for Peace, for example, in the US, like they're anti-Zionist. And it's really disappointing that IGV until now hasn't taken the stance. And it makes me hard for as a Palestinian, to be honest, to trust them. And, um, so yeah, that's that's what I ask is like centering Palestinian voices and 
I guess I wanted to add. Yeah, I guess um, <laughs> I guess we'll keep it there. Maybe I'll wait for questions after. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Okay, so now this is how I think the format will go. We'll do the best that we can uh, online. Some people will will probably ask a question online. Others, as we have already, will put their questions in the chat. If you can take the microphone off the stand so you can share the microphone when you're answering the questions between the two of you. And, and those on the floor that wants to come and ask a question, they can come and use this mic. So anybody, I will read the questions from the screen, from the chat and anybody asking a question on screen will get three minutes or in the room, will get three minutes to make an intervention or ask the, the question. And we will take two or three questions at a time to give everybody a chance to speak. So if people got paper or pen, we will try to do it that way. And let's see how it goes, okay? And, and I will tell the panelists how much time they've got for the questions.